M. Enzadi Keita is the author of the poetry collection Brief Evidence of Heaven, a finalist for the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Prize that explored the life of Anna Murray Douglas, Frederick Douglass's first wife. She formerly taught creative writing, American literature, and Africana studies at her Sinus College. Her new poetry collection is called Migration Letters. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with Dr. Herman Beavers, a professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the Free Library. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Welcome. Thank you for braving the rain. And uh, I look forward to uh, engaging with you on at the birth of this book. So um, a couple of things before, before I read. I want to um, acknowledge my son, Cabral who created this wonderful image video that you've been enjoying. And um, when you see the front of the book, the dedication page, you'll see a list of names of people who've transitioned. And there was somebody that I forgot, and I just want to say her name, Imbali Umoja. Some of you know her or knew her. And uh, she's in the room, and Bali's in the room. So uh, what I'm going to do is not chat between the poems, because we're going to chat after. And I will um, read some of these odd little poems to you. I say odd simply because the poems have two titles, a number title at the top of the page and a textual title at the bottom. So I'm going to um, give you both titles and then read. And uh, unless there's something that you really need to know, I'm just going to, um, to read and then we'll talk. So again, thank you to everyone who's here tonight and also to everyone at the Free Library who's helped to make this possible. Poem 102, Far. My mother washed your weekly pile of panties while P tested her own body's drawstring with a faint touch, then a nudge. She wanted to get done, to skip the field. She wanted to play. After she hung your drawers up by the scant silk rim made to catch your sweat, she dropped her head into a quiet she could own, this girl whom you called your girl or your day girl, depending on the company, when of course she never was, simply my mother before marriage and children camp. You having a fancy moment, her having a nickel. Nobody looking with a tilted preordained lens at a 10-year-old female, Negro, counting a times table, wrapping a wish like a grace note, like a string around her thumb, a wish for wings. My mother squatted on the way home after her portion of, yes, ma'am, before having to make rules and beds 
and traced the lines. She yanked her own grayish cotton drawers aside to water a slope of pine needles far from your gaze, far from the shade of your house. From poem seven, this section is called Ruby D and Sidney Poitier said what you couldn't say. You do what you can do, feed us, cut while you serve, drive wherever work opens, pray heat and rent and roof, train neatness in fingernails, in shoes, repeat in schoolwork, reinforce clean speech and collars, walk while you drift to sleep, drill church in, not down, freeze white danger behind your teeth. Pray that secrets drown. Save sturdy boxes. Keep sardines, candles, a working radio. Watch while you stand in wonder. Snap an Easter Sunday photo. Swap bets and card switch to risk a sweepstakes change, to do what you vowed and swore. Part faith, part luck, part looks. From poem 107, Ebony Magazine, war. A war was going on, not far off, hungry for people who look like you. A growing war your parents could not shield you from or explain when they snapped off the news. Their lips pulled wide like scars, half scabbed. To comb the heavy silk that passed for air, give sight to words, tamp down your dream of werewolves fanged without foam who might ride north to strangle, bomb, or prowl the nearby woods, you took up the armor of black witness. Those photographs bodies under tablecloths or coats, home to cumbersome wounds. Your finger, compass, moving through the black world, open on your lap. From poem 233, section six. Letters to Mount Airy, West Side. On the porches, a cord run through a mail slot to a record player. We lived our Motown. Our Tamla, Stax, Gordy, Gamble, Chess, our Parliament, RCA, King, Polydor, whatever else, played three minute holidays. Washed it, dried it, wrung and hung it, wore it into battle, rolled up inside our groove we rode at home, harvested all seasons, 
drank treble, sucked the bones clean off the base. Juggle neck matched to a swung ass, no matter which body, everybody counted off James Brown. Sculpted geometric spines gathered to re-sanctify at the base of a tree. Fire slipping, camel walking on those cool family porches. In living rooms with chairs pushed back. Bathroom better be wiped down. Barbecue chips in the kitchen, cream sodas in the sink. Fingers saunter to the bridge as sure on the air as a one-two feeds a three-four. We spun out to cross back on the screen on continuous head swell, shoulder drill, skidded back and bopped the broke down walk cause we had it, owned it, ruled it. Our collard greens cauldron of funk horn religion electrocuted and sweated down to a trash can full of ice. from poem 109, Great Migration Pentimento, Perry County. When you left for college, you waved back to grandparents who had raised crops on land they didn't own, cooked food they couldn't buy from any store, Cut, mopped, and scoured, brushed, stewed, and decorated cakes. In kitchens, she entered according to the side door only rule. Labored in sawmills, hauling whatever tipped him closest to risk. Nosefuls of heavy dangers, iron work never designed to pay enough for savings, for smiling, for clean favor in the shade. Great Migration Pentimento, Stetson East, When you entered Stetson Hall at college, you pushed back a blue open door. You knew the words to lots of songs, but never heard of whist. Carried a cassette player and a Corvette's radio like gifts for the Christ child. Dragged in two pleather suitcases, sky blue. Plants in liquor store boxes. Eked out a dumb anxious smile to a girl with the same key and letter tucked in her jeans. A Jersey girl with a doctor father and a stereo. Turntable, receiver, and speakers, tape, and radio. Hung up a cloth coat, aqua, beside the rabbit collar leather on the door. Polyester coverlet sneaked the gaze at Glen Plaid. Terry cloth robe scrutinized velour. You too would skid from dare to skank to rescue. 
issuing weekly vows of never again turned 344 into beauty hall confessional, study parlor, box of hilarity, into parties sideways like Ohio players singing fire, set more than one, stomp out a few with howls the moon found amusing. But you didn't know that yet. Poem number 23, Multiplied. On my way somewhere else, I stepped into this mirror. I see everything multiplied, my eyes to the glass bowl of the world, feet testifying to ages that came before. My head spinning, young voices, the kind you hear in celebration, green as a cool walk down a summer street toward the sound of your voice, brother, a razor humming. The smooth silver clips of Billy Eckstein humming, the smell of Friday nights as the daytime of me washes down the sink as if according to plan, according to your voice, sister, explaining it all. In contralto measures, from that solitary window, your steadfast singing visited on us. You, sister, leaving your floral trace folded in a southern way, your beautiful blues your years of walking add up to days on our street, your train of petals. You, brother, in the caramel leather chair at Pomona Street, hands still in the barber's silver world, hands free in lion play, your steps in time your music prying momentary strings up through tongues and jackets. Poem 273. WDASFM 1977. With a needle set down on a bass, a balaphone, a shaker ray, a saxophone, WDASFM dismantles your poor cage of a mind. Now it's a fuchsia colander and Pharaoh Saunders will lead the rinse of it, pouring one window open morning. Gold, you hear. Gold, you crave. Tembi transforms a grimy street and someone, call responsive, comes out to sweep. When have people like you had room to exult, to stand in daily power, finding your skin resplendent, the claim of a new thing coating your hand? Last poem is poem 184. J. 
just a section of it. Section number four of letters to the first gen North. That would be my generation. Collectors climbing the front stairs to the ballroom on the outside of platter and mop, above the boiler, out the pantry, ununiformed sometimes, under contract to Jesus and Yemanya, Allah and Avon and Mary Kay, government and social mandates. You might show up anywhere. Suburbs, cubicles, taxi cabs, fleeing the rusty nail tavern or renting a stool. Nod, dap, handshake, squeeze, you get in where you fit in. You know how to talk shit to doormen. You recognize red caps, greet housekeepers, tip cash. You know what looks too black. How to renovate smiles. When you knock at a homecoming door, they watch from some southern county, they will always wake up inside. They peer through the screen, brighten, raising a hand or foot to trumpet the joy that leaps from their bandages. Something worked out right for all their secret trials. Thank you. I tell you that. Um, first, thank you for the reading, and, and thank you to the Free Library for this program, and thank you all for coming. Um, one of the things I love about Philadelphia is that these things happen without a whole lot of fanfare and hype and dreck. Um, in New York, it have, would have taken them a year to plan something like this. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes. Um, I had a, my, my third grade teacher used to say at the end of school, we have Twenty golden minutes. <laughs> um, so, I think the the best place to start. Well, let me let me first begin by talking about my 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 sense of this book after I got done reading it. Okay. Um, there is um, a relentlessness to this book, and I don't mean that in a pejorative. Um, I, I mean it in the sense that um, uh, the book, um, there's not a single moment in this book where I don't feel like you're going for broke in, in every poem. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that, um, uh, I, that the poems are out of control. It means that all of the, I feel like all of the voices that we have in our heads when we write poems um, I feel like you've really silenced those voices to write to write this book, and and I and I love that. Um, I want to start with the idea of the archive, mm. um, because in their way, archives can be relentless. Oh. They can be relentless in their exclusion of black bodies in this moment where. Uh, we have people that would be only too happy to pile books up in uh, uh, City Hall and, and burn them. Uh, 
they can be uh, 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 relentlessly uh, abused. Um, but one of the things, and I'm speaking here as a, as a professor of African American literature, one of the things that really made our field possible um, was the archive, was people going into the archive and, and, and finding, um, finding letters and um, pamphlets and um, doodlings that, that we made. Um, and what became clear is that there's not, there's not ever been a time when black people have not been making their world mm -hmm. around them. Um, I identified with this book. Um, uh, my, my mother's family's from Pittsburgh, and um, she cleaned white people's floors her entire life. Um, so those, 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 those poems about being a domestic really, really hit home, because mm -hmm. um, I used to go with her to work. <laughs> um, but back to the archive, you know, as, the, as, as Cabral's great uh, slideshow demonstrates, um, it's very difficult for us to have sort of isolated archives. Our, 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 our archives always seem to intermingle with other archives. Hmm. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because when I saw the title of the book, um, you know, letters are a very personal thing, but when you tack the word migration onto it, it takes on this whole different cast. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay, well, on the subject of the archive, <laughs> um, the blessing of what we did there with Cabral taking the lead uh, was that we're, I, I don't know if we, we seem to be an unusual family in this. But my grandmother, who you saw at some point on screen, who had a second grade education, um, when, when she and my grandfather moved the family to Philly, uh, sometime whenever, I don't know when Brownie cameras were invented and came, came into popular use, but she got one and she started taking pictures of everything that moved, we, you know, and mostly, you know, Sunday and holidays. But over time, our family, um, and I'm talking about my mother's side, cultiva cultivated and um, accumulated a photo archive that's unbelievable. Um, when my mother died in 2017, uh, she, and this is just her pile, mind you, she had um, amassed, I think, about 165 photo albums. And bless her heart, a lot of them were labeled. They were semi-organized for themes and uh, time periods. And so we came to adulthood, my siblings and I and my cousins, in a tradition of taking family photographs uh, like in the extreme. So my sister, my middle sister has a considerable number of photographs. Um, the Cata family has its own archive of photographs. And so, um, so you know, we, we weren't thinking about, we were just, you know, it was, it was just the way we did things. But later you look up and realize that, you know, maybe this is where my history fang comes from, you know, that, uh, that we, we grew up with this sense of history, personal history, private history, um, but, but this sense of sort of trajectory of the family over time. So, you know, as, and, and, and when a few years ago we had another major death in the family and we had to sort of come to grips with all these albums and me and my sister started labeling them. And, and so it goes beyond sort of the, you know, the older members that we are, but um, you know, there's, there's whole books of my two sons that my mother put together throughout their uh, personal history. 
So, so I, and, and, and in talking to people and friends and such, uh, people seem to be startled by that. Like I, I went to college with a woman who had one picture of herself when they started doing the class pictures, you know. She, that was the only pictures of herself that she had as a child. And I didn't even know what to make of that. So, so we seem to be odd in some way in the volume of, of photographs we have. And so, um, so that sense of the archive, and it was slow to come to me, I'll admit. I was working on these poems for like maybe seven years over various points in time. But not until the last year and a half did this sort of intersection of our, our photo archive raise up to me as that this is part of what you're doing. So I don't know how well I answered what you wanted uh, me to, a, but ask a me great, another question. It's a great start because I think that um, we both grew up at a time when, um, until Polaroid cameras, you know, you take pictures and you have to wait till they were developed. And um, uh, my parents, they'd just be rolls and rolls and rolls of film. And some, at some point, they'd, they'd develop them. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, th I think is a really sort of persistent quality in the poems is their relationship to photographs <laughs> um, and, and uh, the, the details um, that one finds in, in, in photographs. Um, mm -hmm. You can, uh, I, I know when I think of the photographs in my family, you can, you can sort of identify what year it is based on how much plastic my mother has on the sofa. Because <laughs> um, if it's a lot of plastic, it means that we're older. And she's she like, I'm going to tear you off if y'all. Um, uh, <laughs> On, on the other hand, um, you know, what was, what these poems also made me think about was when my family moved from the city of Cleveland out to the suburbs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, we, we still lived in a segregated community, but, but there are all of these names. Um, so for years, there was a street that, that ran off of my street that I just called the New Road. Um, like, oh, who's on? They live on a new road. It, I, was, I was probably 12 or 13 before I realized it was Gerard Avenue. And I think what comes through in these poems, particularly the poems about Mount Airy, um, is that um, our sense of place as children and as young people is as palpable as, as that of adults. Um, in some ways, more so because uh, you got to know shortcuts. If the street lights are about to come on, um, there are all of these things that, um, uh, you know, live, being at my grandmother's in, in, in Pittsburgh in the summertime, she'd be like, you can, you can play from that bush mm -hmm. to those bushes at the end of the street, and I better not see you pass. So your sense of space is on the one hand impinged upon by adults, but on the other hand, there's this expansiveness that as you make friends who live on different streets, mm -hmm. your world expands. And, and, mm -hmm. and the book captures that, I think. Oh, it tries to. Beautifully. You know, there's, there's a lot of ghost poems <laughs> that didn't <laughs> uh, thrive or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Some of them are probably trapped in a notebook or a document somewhere. Well, but, but I, yeah. I did, um, I was working out of that reality. Um, uh, and there, you know, there's also that, I, I, parallel might be too strong, but um, when you see the book, you'll see. There's, there's a section uh, of poems, a little suite of poems that um, have to do with the, the film, A Raisin in the Sun. And that, that film was so significant to us as a family because it came out, I think, in 61 or 62. And we were all little. My youngest sister wasn't even born yet. But to sit in front of a television and see not just black people, that was remarkable in and of itself, but to see a family that was struggling and trying to improve their lot in life 
and, and with a frustrated father and a hardworking, bitten down mother, like that was just, whoa. It was so close to, you know, we, we understood that film like fundamentally. Even though, you know, like the, the younger's apartment, it, things were not that desperate with us. But, but the parallels were like so stark. And so, you know, so, so growing up, so we, we knew nobody ever talked about this, but we didn't have to. We were living it, and some of us were looking at everything. And, and I understood that there was something significant about us moving to um, Mount Airy that, that was different than we lived in central Germantown before when I was very small. And that was pleasant and beautiful, but there was something else flowing when we moved to Mount Airy. And, and, and we were all conscious of it. When my siblings and I got older and we would talk about and look back at how we grew up, we would, a point of laughter was always, remember when all the white kids left the neighborhood? Yeah, 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 and it was like, boom. It was within six months. Like, they were almost stopped in the middle of sentences. Gotta go in, bye, <laughs> never saw them again. So, 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 you know, like that was a message to us. And when more black kids moved in the neighborhood, that was a message to us. And the way that the family, the, the adults sort of uh, let us run free, but also, you know, had some parameters like, yeah, you better be home by. That, you know, that was all very tangible stuff for us. And, and you know, me, I just, you know, total nerd in the house, you know, taking notes. <laughs> so, so it became part of what I was thinking about in these poems. Well, I, 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 I'm happy that you're talking about that suite of poems about A Raisin in the Sun, because I, I found those to be the most compelling poems in the book. Um, particularly you. the poem about Travis. Oh, goodness. Really? Um, because Ouch. nobody, we, we don't know when the film ends what's going to happen. We sort of know. We, well, we sort of know. But, 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 but um, maybe some of you have seen the play Clyburn Park, which, yeah. is, uh, which is kind of a sequel to A Raisin in the Sun uh, in a very odd way. Yeah, um, odd. But uh, in, in both instances, because, because the, the question that Clyburn Park raises, that a raisin in the sun gestures toward but doesn't raise is, why did the white people sell the house to beneath the younger in the first place? And Clyburn Park answers that question. So if mm. you haven't read it or seen it, you, I, I, I strongly uh, invite you to, to, to look at that. But, but there's a line where, where Travis is in Clyburn Park and he's trying to figure it out. And you really do a wonderful job of mapping out how treacherous it is. So I, 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 one, I want to ask you how, you how you went about thinking about that. Mm. Because the okay. film doesn't give you enough other than, than um, and there's a, I'll tell, in, a, in a second I'll tell a story about the, the film that I think is relevant to the making of the film that's relevant. Mm. Um, uh, we don't, what we know is that Travis is going to have a backyard. That's what, mm -hmm. that's what we know. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what other thinking went into trying to imagine his life outside of the city of Chicago. Yeah, that was definitely, that poem was a work of very much of imagination. Um, but, you know, as I said, we, we watched the movie, I mean, the movie used to come on every year through the 60s. And we watched it over and over again. I, I don't know how many times I've seen that film. Um, but it was, it's to the point where uh, my late brother and I used to, we were both like movie geeks, and sometimes we'd be hanging out. And he would say, I'm, I'm a giant surrounded by ants. You know, I mean, we would just like throw lines at each other. Um, that's how many times we've seen it. But then uh, what really happened over time, you know, when you've seen something that many times, I started thinking about 
beyond the, the main narrative. Like I, at, at some point, and teaching it <laughs> to any, if there's any of my formers out there that, that sat through 15 weeks of, with me in African American Lit, that was, a, that was just gonna happen. We were gonna do Raisin in the Sun. And teaching it really was where maybe that, that Travis poem started, the seed started, because in class discussions and stuff, we start, I started to focus more on the end of the play. And, and I'll never forget, there was a student, Antonio Good, I don't know where he is now, but he said, they should have took the money. <laughs> 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 and almost nobody thought that, right? But, but what I started to focus, I started to look at Benita and say, when has there ever been a black woman college student on film? Mm -hmm. I couldn't think of one mm -hmm. at that point in the early 60s. And with Travis, you know, Travis was like um, the symbol of my generation, almost. Travis was like, oh, 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 really? Y'all are moving to a nice neighborhood. How nice is it going to be for me? What's going to happen to me at the bus stop? So we started talking about this in class, and it, it seeds sprouted in my head. And, and you know, I always enjoyed the moments when Travis was in there because Travis was, um, he was, he, he was emblematic of that next generation that I was part of that like, nobody knew what we were gonna be up against. They were just like, oh, this is a better school. Oh, Mount Airy is a wonderful place to live. Oh, you know, like we, nobody knew. You know, it was, it was the push forward from the civil rights movement and the wanting to do better and the expectations that came from down south with people. And, you know, and, and a trust and a hope and a faith that think it would be better. But, but Travis was the one that was gonna pay some prices on that. Cause who was he gonna, my first real thought from that poem is, who was Travis gonna play with? What was he gonna do on the block? Who, you know, and what was, and also going to school, where was he gonna go to school and what was gonna happen at the bus stop? And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that started to flow. Yeah, moving to a community that doesn't think in terms of blocks. Well, there's right? that too. Thank um, goodness for the backyard. Um, so, so quick, quick story about the film. When Hansberry turned in the first draft of the screenplay, the, the studio looked at it and she had in the, the state, the uh, screenplay that there's an unbroken shot from the south side of Chicago and it pans over the city of Chicago and it lands on the house of the family that Walter works for. Oh, that Walter works for. And so Hansberry's point was to link um, this privilege and this wealth to bl this, the squalor that black people live in in these mm -hmm. tenements. Mm -hmm. And the studio cut it out of the film. <laughs> um, uh, much to Hansberry's dismay. I'm and sure. the other thing that they decided was um, that the only person, the only white person you would see in the film is um, Mr. Guy, Linder. Mr. Linder. So they didn't want the audience to connect race and race systemic racism to the to the younger's plight, um, and so that's that's why I found the poem so deeply affecting because I think the the poems do real anthropological work in terms of sort of situating the movie in all the ways that you just described that that mm -hmm. it's doing this very important work at a time when your phone rings and um, folks are like, Ruby D and, and, and Sydney Portier are on, are on channel 43. Turn on ch channel six. <laughs> um, it might have been one of the first movies that my parents let me stay up and watch mm -hmm. all the way through. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it came out, I, I was young when it came out. By the time mm -hmm. I actually saw it, it mm -hmm. was much It was probably in the early 70s. Um, so I want to make a turn because I know the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about form because um, uh, even though uh, migration letters suggest a kind of chronology, the poem, the book does not do that. The, bo the book really no, sort of eschews yeah. 
the idea of chronology. But I wanted to ask you about, and of course, can't find them in my notes. Um, here it is. I wanted to ask about uh, um, two things. And, and um, you'll forgive us if this sounds like insider baseball uh, with, with two poets talking about it, but, but um, y'all shouldn't have let me up on stage if that's not what y'all <laughs> wanted to happen. Um, first, I want to talk about prosody because I, I actually pulled out several poems and I scanned them. Um, and and um, even though the poems in some instances have very open forms to them, uh, there are there are prosodies in the book in the form of the cadence of black speech. Mm -hmm. um, you know the, the the vocal inflection that your 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 mother or your grandmother or your grandfather um, uh, takes on when they are when they are talking to us. Um, and the other thing is that um, uh, sonically speaking, and I and I and I noticed this as you were reading the poems. Sonically speaking, this poem leaves space for the sounds in the poem to resonate. And, and um, to me, that is reminiscent of the sermonic tradition. Mm. Um, so if you've ever heard, if you've ever been to a black church um, and you've, or you've heard somebody like Reverend C.L. Franklin, um, they're masters, or Gardner Taylor, they're masters of sort of delivering a sermon, but at various points, they, they leave a small space for the congregation to respond to what they're saying. And the sermon actually can't work without that. Um, so it's not, like, it's not like a Catholic service or a, a Methodist service where you get talked at and nobody, and you can hear a pin drop. Black church, it's, it's, it's a sonic event. And, and what, I, what I love about what this book accomplishes throughout is, is that the sonic is really important to the book. So maybe, maybe we shift from, the, from talking about prosody to talking about the sonic aspects of the book and how you thought about that and shaped that to make, this, to make these poems. Well, yes. The, the, all of the material in some way you know, is rooted in African American vernacular English and vernacular thinking, even when the English is more standard. Um, and working class attitudes that are informed in the case of me, who went to church steadily for many a year. Um, so that those working class attitudes are laced with the experience of hearing a sermon every Sunday. Um, so, so some of that stuff is, is, is very ground up in me. And, and, it, and it comes out without my calling it. Um, I, I think what I'm trying to say is I, sometimes I just have a sense of there is, there is a need for that space. Uh, there is a sort of gap where some reflection needs to happen. You know, when, when, and, and, and so in terms of African American vernacular, there's, there's, a, there's ways of talking, there's ways of not talking <laughs> that, that, are, that are sort of uh, distinct. Uh, there's, there's when you're getting laid out by an elder and you're a child, there's, there's a certain pacing to that as well as the pacing to what happens in church. Um, there's a certain pacing to when you're, be, if you're a girl and you're hearing the rule of the road about how you carry yourself out in public and, or if you're going to a party or if you're going to somebody else's house where you're the representative of the family, there's a certain way that those rules are laid out to you. So, so it's, you know, it's that oral culture 
is, is in and through uh, so much of the life that I'm looking at that it kind of just creeps in. I don't really want to say on its own, but it's, it's kind of there. I'm pulling from it. I'm thinking about it. There's a poem called Holes that I'll just go ahead and say. My grandfather just came out in the room, practically. My grandfather just kind of made that poem with me. And I didn't really see it coming. It, it started with like one line. I thought I was just thinking about his voice. The next thing I know, Pop Pop like grabbed the mic, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, so it's very, it's, it's, it's very ingrained in me. So there's, that's a culture piece and, and, the, and the personal history piece. But I, I also am a child of the black arts movement. I wouldn't be sitting here right now if Amiri Baraka and Sonia Sanchez and Harki Matabudi and The Last Poets and some other folk, um, uh, Askia Ture somewhat, ha if those people hadn't gotten hold of me, I don't, I don't even know really who I'd be. But, but I know that that was a generation of poets and a movement that enforced um, the idea that, that poems had to be spoken. And so that's been ingrained in my process for a long, long time to the point where um, I'm, you know, I'm not in that genre of people who would readily be considered a spoken word poet, but I don't, I can't work through a poem without hearing it. So those, you know, so those practices as part of my writing process and as part of my cultural makeup um, they are just there. And as to how it all comes together, I can't really, I can't help you on that. That's Hi, Dr. Keira, that was amazing, just so beautiful, thank you. Um, I do have a question um, about the titles. Um, so we just got the book, so we haven't really been able to like think about it, but um, there's two titles, a number title and a title at the end um, in brackets. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Okay, I can. Um, I, I found out when I was writing Brief Evidence of Heaven, which is my last book, my most re recent book before this, um, I fell into this rabbit hole around numbers because the subject of that book was illiterate. And I discovered that people who, are, who can't read or can't read well are often really facile with numbers. Mm -hmm. And several poems came out of that and all kinds of reading and geeky research. But what I discovered in doing that was that I have a number twitch. And I didn't realize it. So, um, so there's, there's that piece. Then there's the fact that th these poems started as a writing exercise. After I finished Brief Evidence, where I, I was immersed in the 19th century for like five or six years, and I was like, and the book was out, and I felt like bereft, like what am I, what am I doing now? And, and so I just needed to start writing something. I didn't know what it was gonna be. It didn't have a grand design. I just needed to sort of write every day. So I was writing these little short things that sort of had a tone of a letter to it. Um, it, it was one particular person I wanted to say something to, and it started with me writing a, a short note to that person. And so every time I wrote another thing to a different person or a collective of people, I just, in my notebook, I gave it a number. I wasn't, it, it wasn't anything more than just to keep track. So over time, um, you know, the, the, the volume grew like, I think there was like 400 of these things. And they were in different folders on my computer. And then when I started sorting them, of course, you know, it was not magically uh, the ones that I liked didn't turn out to be in numeric order. But I was, my number thing, um, I, I sort of find a magic in numbers similar to w the kind of impact that certain names have. So I just left the numbers there. I, I had relationships to the numbers. It sounds weird out loud. <laughs> um, so, 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 that's, so the numbers kept staying. And I kept going, are you sure about this? Are you? 
and I don't know, after a while, I just got attached to the numbers being there. The other thing about the, the title at the bottom is that it's just, it's just a personal thing. I've been reading poems and writing poems a long time. And I started to tire of the title being at the top, preempting what, like framing what you're going to think about what you're going to read next. And part of my personal reading uh, sort of proclivity is I love to fall into something. I don't want a whole lot of, if, a, if I start a, a novel and they're talking about the spring trees, I'm like, I'm out. I want to be in the story immediately. And I, so I wanted readers to just like, I mean, of course, yes, you can cheat and look at the title. But I just wanted people to open to the page and boom, go right to the first line. And then, OK, you know, there's, the there's a text title at the bottom. But maybe you feel differently about it after if you just read from top to bottom. You know, maybe, maybe something else happens if you just experience the poem without this foregrounding of a title. Because, you know, I don't know. I, I know that people are scared of poetry. <laughs> I know that well. <laughs> and so, and I know that for some people, like, the title really helps them to enter in. So it's there if you want to, you know, read it first. But, I, but my personal preference was just, I was indulging myself, I guess. So that's, that's the story of that whole format. Spread the word, because <laughs> I, I know it strikes one as weird, perhaps. The publishers gave me grief, too. So um, we are at time. Uh, so a uh, couple things. One, um, thanks to everybody for coming out. But, but the fun continues, because there are books upstairs to be purchased and signed. Um, and you can ask your questions uh, to, to Dr. Kata while, while she's signing books, perhaps. Um, and I personally am going to hang around a little bit because uh, I just want I just want to continue to soak up this energy and um, thank you for that that that, that explanation because because my experience reading the title last it, it, it was like this ah mm -hmm. as opposed to congratulating myself because okay I, it, it, the title was this this is what it means. Mm -hmm. um, one last thing, because um, because because I've 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 read your first the, the uh, brief evidence of heaven. I just have to say this: um, if you haven't read brief evidence of heaven, um, I strongly encourage you to do it because we knew nothing. I knew nothing of Anna Murray Douglas. It is, it, it is the best biography that you could ever read of Anna Murray Douglas. Um, it is just a fabulous piece of work. The only thing that I think approximates what you did is, is Marilyn, Nelson, Marilyn Nelson's Carver. Um, so, so when you put these two books together, um, you're go I, I'm, 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 I'm a, against the idea of talking about the black experience, but, but um, this book really is, this m Migration Letters is capacious enough that you will feel included in this book. Um, and with that, let's go upstairs and sign some books. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>